started. Um, thank you for coming. I'm glad I've got some faces in here. I know I'm competing with Steve Sanderson and John Skeet. So anyone in this room is good. Um, hopefully some people online as well. Um, my name's Steve. I'm a Microsoft MVP, Pluralsight author, and engineer at Elastic. I work on the language clients team at Elastic. Um, and that might give you a clue as to why I've chosen this title for this session. A um, little bit about the title, just to make sure everyone's expectations are correct. Uh, this is an introductory level talk, so if you've used Elasticsearch much, uh, you probably know a lot or some of this stuff. Um, but Hopefully, it will also be a good recap on some technology that you've already heard about, and then we'll move more towards the latter half of the session to talk about uh, the .NET client and working with Elasticsearch.net. So, um, so that's, that's kind of the plan, but if it is too introductory for you, I won't be offended if you decide to kind of find somewhere else to go. Um, the other important thing is there is a bit.ly link there. Um, everyone wants the slides after the session. I've got like a resources link at the end in the slides. That link takes you to the slide deck. So, Grab that link and you'll have access to all of the resources and all of the information that I'm going to cover in the session today. Um, it's a three-day conference, so if you have any questions that you don't get answered in this session or after this session, come and find me over any of the three days at the, the event. I'll be happy to uh, talk about Elasticsearch and the .NET client with you. Um, I'm very keen for that. But if you, if you think of something later, uh, you can reach out to me. I'm on Twitter, at Steve J. Gordon. Um, and you can follow my blog as well, where I hope to kind of get that going again with more posts about uh, Elasticsearch and, and using the .NET client. So with that, let's dive straight in. Um, I'm not a marketing person, but I do have a marketing looking slide that I stole out of our corporate slide deck. Um, but it's a good intro to who we are as a company. So, uh, you know, how many people in this room have actually heard of Elastic already? Most, nearly everyone, that's good. Uh, it means my work here is really easy. You probably know then that you know, we primarily do stuff around search. That's what people know us for. Um, we build search solutions on top of a single stack. So what does that mean? Well, we have the core stack that I'm going to introduce to you in a moment. But we also use that stack ourselves to develop products and solutions that you can use for search-based uh, activities within your organizations as well. So one of those is enterprise search. Enterprise search gives you various capabilities. One of the things you could do is point at a, a website or an application and have it crawl that site, gather data that you can then expose through a search box on that website. So it might be good if you're running a blog, for example, you could point uh, Elasticsearch at that. Um, you can also use it for sorting and searching data within your organization. So everyone has huge disparate amounts of data now. We have stuff in GitHub, we have stuff over in a wiki, we have stuff on Google Docs and Slack. And finding that information, knowing where to look for the answer to a question you might have internally can always be tough. Enterprise Search allows you to crawl all of those sources for that information, index it, and make it searchable in your organization. And we use that internally, and it proves really useful. I'm tracking stuff down, and I find someone slacked a message about that in the past, and I get the answer that I'm looking for. We also do stuff around observability. Um, everyone is sort of building more and more sort of distributed systems, cloud-based solutions and services. Um, observability is really important in those scenarios to understand how things are working, if they're working, and if they're working normally. And we have various products and technologies within that solution space for observability. Uh, so we have APM that you can install into various platforms to gather data about your applications, how they're running. Uh, we also have the capability to expose that to you in dashboards through Kibana and build alerting and tooling around that. And you can even combine that with our ML technologies to start having alerts that are a bit more intelligent and are actually looking for true outliers in your data rather than just fixed levels that may or may not alert incorrectly for you. And then finally, we have some stuff around security. Again, security is another big topic in organizations. How do we secure our environments? How do we understand if they're secure and where are the risks? Our security solutions can uh, detect threats within your organization, detect those potential uh, attacks that may be happening and help you mitigate against them. So that's some of the stuff we do. You can check out our website for a lot more information on all of that. Today, I'm going to be focused on one small part of our stack, really, which is Elasticsearch. But it is the heart of the stack, pretty much everything. Uh, links into Elasticsearch in some way or another. Um, it's the data store, fundamentally, where all of your data is going to get stored. It's going to be indexed, and it's going to be made searchable. So this is where we're going to do all of the search and al analysis of our data. And Elasticsearch is kind of where the company began. But we've evolved over the last sort of number of years to build out much bigger uh, stack that makes it a lot easier to utilize Elasticsearch for the things you may be building. And one of the tools that we have is Kibana. This is our UI layer 
This gives you the capability to not only manage your Elasticsearch cluster, so actually do you know, your configuration, setting up users, that kind of operational type management, but it also gives you the ability to visualize the data that's stored in those clusters. Um, and so you can build dashboards, you can build reporting tools for internal or external customers that you may need to be able to show people to see how things are operating in your business. Um, we used it quite extensively in my old job just as part of our sort of platform monitoring system that we were able to sort of see how all of our services were performing and if any of the servers looked like they were getting unexpected loads, that kind of thing. We also need to get data into Elasticsearch and Elasticsearch has an API and we'll be talking more about using the .NET client to interact with that API in a bit. But sometimes you, know, you have common data sources within your organization that you want to use uh, as, as sources for data that's going into Elasticsearch. And we have a number of products as part of our stack that help you with that. The most recent, I guess, of those is Elastic Agent and is typically the one you should sort of start looking at first. Well, you can install this agent on servers, services, and, and, and various devices around your organization and connect it into our fleet server so that you can then start managing your fleet of um, servers in terms of how you want to collect data from them. So you can set up profiles to gather various log data or metric data off those systems. Um, before Agent, we had Beats, which is a very similar concept, but you needed to install specific Beats on each server instance where you needed to collect certain types of data, maybe metrics or audit data. Each of these was an independent installation. Elastic Agent makes that easier by kind of essentially giving you a central management point for doing all of that configuration. And then finally, uh, we have Logstash, which is, as the name may suggest, about log data. Typically with this, you would point it at a directory that contains or will contain some log data and have it scrape that data, parse it, process it, and store it into Elasticsearch for you. So we have a number of those kind of pipelines for common log file formats today, um, but it's also extremely extensible and configurable if you want to build your own pipelines for your own specific log data. You can determine how that data gets processed, split apart, which pieces of that information you care about storing, do some kind of enrichment. So if you've got IP data in there, you may do GIP lookups as part of your ingestion pipeline, um, and then bringing that all into Elasticsearch. So this is the kind of core stack. This is what our solutions are built on top of and what you can build your solutions on top of as well. In terms of where you can and how you can run this, um, today the best choice if you're kind of getting started and you're new to this will be usually Elastic Cloud. This is our software as a service offering and it gives you the ability to spin up a deployment of Elasticsearch you know, at the few clicks of a button. Um, and it gives you the ability to manage that deployment with very little sort of overhead, really. We do all of the hard work of making sure everything's spun up and configured correctly and secured and talking to one another. And you can really focus on how much data do I need to store? What sort of scale am I looking to start with? And, and then just getting started with it. Um, I use it quite often just for prototyping things, um, you know, just testing out ideas, testing out things I'm gonna be able to put into the client, that kind of thing. Um, and it's a really good way of doing that with, with as I say, very little overhead. We also have on-prem. Um, you may be in an organization that can't um, or doesn't want to use cloud. Um, that's fine. Uh, we have on-prem offerings for that. We can offer Elastic Cloud uh, Enterprise, which is essentially the Elastic Cloud UI and management plane, but in your own environment, which is quite nice. It means you get sort of the best of both worlds if you're in that situation where you're not allowed to put data into the cloud. Um, you can use that. Similarly, if you're in a sort of containerized environment and heavy into sort of Kubernetes and things, you can get started with Elastic Cloud on Kubernetes as well. The final option, which is the kind of I want to do everything myself mode, is standalone. And you're now fully responsible for installing your Elasticsearch instances onto servers or VMs or however you want to get those up and running, maybe even Docker. Um, but you're then responsible for making sure that stuff works works reliably and is configured correctly to be secure and all of that kind of stuff. So it's, it's kind of the option you probably don't want to go to first today because you know, there's a lot of things you have to think about. And by going towards the cloud end of this, most of it is just sliders and choices around scaling that you need to deal with. Um, it's also important to mention as well that I missed, missed saying that Elastic Cloud is available in all of the major cloud providers. So while you access it through our cloud sort of platform, you can determine where your deployments exist. It might be Azure, Google Cloud, AWS. Um, means you can put your, you know, your data services near where the rest of your application stuff may be running in a cloud already. So let's start with you know, the real intro to Elasticsearch and some of the basic um, terminology, and we'll sort of start to ramp up into the deeper layers of this as we go. So the first term, I've used it a few times already, uh, is cluster. A cluster is really simply a collection of 
servers or really Elasticsearch instances is the thing to think about. So the cluster is the way you group the, logically um, your sort of data environment together. And through that, all of your data is stored and all of the federated indexing and searching capabilities happen. So it's really more of a logical concept. There are some configuration options that you will configure that would be cluster wide, but mostly it's about choosing a cluster name that you want your servers to join into and start working as a distributed data store. In terms of how that looks, uh, we have nodes. Nodes are really just an instance of Elasticsearch. So it might be a physical server, it might be a VM, uh, could be a container. Um, ultimately, it's just that installation of Elasticsearch that's going to be working together with the other nodes within the system to be able to provide the services that you need from Elasticsearch. And how you set this up um, depends on your needs within your organization. You can run a one node cluster, uh, don't do it in production, uh, but you can do it when you're developing just to kind of get started and experiment with things. Often in cloud, I'll you know, spin up just a single node thing in the cloud I'm going to use one today uh, for the later demos. So you can do that just to get started. You don't need to have the full capacity, but obviously as your system moves towards production, you need to start thinking about how's this thing going to scale? How's it going to be um, resilient to faults and that kind of thing? And so a minimum of three nodes is kind of where you want to get to as a, an entry level uh, cluster. When I worked for my previous company, we had what I thought at the time was quite a big cluster. We had about 35 nodes and we were quite impressed that we had terabytes of data and 7 million documents a day. Since joining Elastic, I've learned that we were barely touching the, the tip of the iceberg in terms of pure scale of this thing. Uh, there's people running you know, hundreds, hundreds, maybe even thousands of nodes together to get uh, really large volumes of data indexed and searched. Uh, in their environments. The main thing about the nodes is by default they, configured, they are configured to kind of start up in essentially multi, a multi-role situation. They'll do pretty much anything as part of their operation within the cluster. But as you, as you move towards production and you get a feel for what your cluster is actually needing to do in terms of operations that you're ha will be happening, you may start to determine specific roles for specific nodes and also start splitting those roles against more appropriate hardware types for those roles. So for example, Data nodes will need a lot of disk capacity to store the physical data that's part of the index that you're storing there. And they generally need quite a good amount of memory, uh, high performance memory for the in-memory data structures that are needed to prov provide the search capabilities very quickly. Other nodes that are about sort of maintaining the cluster state and maintaining how the cluster is operating uh, are called master nodes. And you really only need basic machines as master eligible nodes. So typically, once you get past a certain size, you'll start to have dedicated master nodes that are purely about keeping the cluster alive and not about storing data or performing search or index capabilities. Similarly, if you want to use our machine learning technologies within the cluster, uh, we typically would expect you to have machine learning dedicated nodes uh, just for performing those functions and they may have higher CPU loads, um, may have, again, higher memory loads, so you might want to choose appropriate hardware for those types of jobs. This isn't something you have to determine right up front. You can start with this kind of a free node cluster with all the roles. And then as you kind of understand the data you're dealing with and understand your environment, that's when you start adding nodes to the cluster and giving them different roles just through configuration. Then we have the concept of an index. Index is one of those terms that's kind of a bit overloaded. It's a noun, it's a verb. But in this case, it's the noun, the object, which is really just a collection of documents. Uh, logically within your, your data store. And often questions come in from like, how, how should I determine what should go into what index and, and what's my strategy? And the answer is it really does depend on your data. Um, if you are, for example, running a blog website and you just want to provide a search capability across that, then you can have a single index that contains all of the blog posts as data objects that you want to be able to search across. And that's relatively finite data. Even on a, a large blog, we're talking thousands of documents probably at most. But sometimes we have data that isn't really finite as such. So log data would be a great example. This data is going to be continually coming in from applications and servers over time. And typically what you do in that scenario is you start to move towards a strategy where you have indexes created in, in sort of buckets. So you might have weekly indexes uh, for storing that data as time goes on. And you'll notice I always forget to be able to say indices and indexes. It doesn't really matter. Um, I, I use both. Um, but you can spread that data across uh, as, as time goes on. So typically by doing that, it gives you more capability for determining how that data is backed up and also how you store it uh, maybe on colder, less uh, high-powered hardware over time. 
But typically, index data, you want to be able to search over the immediate last maybe few days of data very quickly. But most of your year old data may be needing, needed for sort of regulatory reasons or auditing reasons, but you typically aren't doing hot searches across that data all the time. And so you can have strategies where through our index lifecycle management policies, you can configure data to move through a lifecycle where it goes on to older and older nodes, which are basically cheaper hardware for you, to the point where you can even have data stored in blob stores as searchable snapshots, where you can actually search across it. It's going to be slower, but it's going to be a lot cheaper. And so you can start to think about these strategies as time goes on. I won't be talking about them today, but most of that's done for a technology called data streams, where you configure a stream of data, and it handles configuring a policy behind the scenes for you that will roll that data over to indexes over time. Within an index, we have uh, shards. And shard is just a, you know, a common term in distributed databases. How are we going to separate this data so that we can spread the load uh, across multiple systems? And so in this case, uh, let's take this example at the moment where this first index of ours we've configured with a single primary shard. So there are a few problems with this. There are a few things we need to think about as engineers. Um, but the first thing is, imagine this is our main index. That we, This is why we have a cluster. We've got three nodes, and we've set it up. But we're only creating a single shard of our data. So this means all of the data for that index lives on node one. It also means all of the search and the index load is on node one. Uh, it's not a great use of the, the other two nodes in our cluster, which are essentially sitting there uh, doing nothing. So one of the things we need to think about when we design uh, how we're going to create our indexes uh, in the system is how do we want to shard that data? And there's no fixed answer on this. Some of this is documented on our blog posts and our, our documentation that gives you some guidance. But it really depends on your data loads, how much ingestion will you have, how much search will you have, how much overall data have you got, to, as to what's the right number of shards for your system. And sometimes it is a case of trying different things. Again, in my old job, we started with a strategy, I think, where we were on three shards for our, uh, each index. And uh, after time, we realized if we split that out into, I think, six shards, we got better throughput overall. And it was a kind of right balance. Because there is a cost associated with sharding your data. There's a management overhead. And, and search may have to you know, split it, uh, con consolidate its data again afterwards. So what we typically recommend is you have more than one primary shard for your data and it's split across um, some of your nodes. You don't really care which nodes. The cluster and Elasticsearch will configure itself to put shards for the best load balancing across the system. But in this case, now we're in a situation where our data is now spread across the three nodes. And this is done by just hashing the ID, essentially, of the documents as they come in. And then that data lives on a particular node. And it means that when we do a search now across the entire index, that search can be sent to each of the nodes. Each of them is collecting and gathering the data that's the matches for that search. And then it gets consolidated back together again at the end. Now, this situation is better from a point of view of getting a better load across our system. Uh, we still have a resiliency issue here in this design. And we can resolve that by having replicas. So as well as configuring the number of primaries we want, we can configure the number of replicas that we want as well. In this case, we said we want one replica, which means we want one replica of each primary, hence we have three actual shards there that are showing up. And the key thing here is that Elasticsearch is obviously going to try and put this in a, a sensible configuration that means that we have resiliency. So now nodes one, node one has primary one, and replica one is on node two. And this means that we could lose node one entirely, and we'd be still in a situation where we can perform search initially. And as soon as the cluster detects that the health is no longer in a good state, it can't reach node one, and it needs to figure out, well, what primaries were on node one? And how do I promote the replicas so that we can get back to a state where everything's healthy and we're able to take data back in and index it again? So this configuration is important to think about as you move towards production. Uh, you will want at least one replica. And you also want to think about your backup strategy through snapshots as well. But uh, that's sort of a bit past what we're going to get into today. The final piece of uh, basic terminology is a document. And a document is a unit of data, really. Um, Elasticsearch is uh, a JSON-based uh, document store. So you send a JSON object into the database that represents the data you want to have indexed in there. And that, that actual source document will be stored by default as part of the record within Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch um, documents needs generally to have some related characteristics to make sense putting them in the same index. But each index is schemaless by design. And so you can send it any data that you want, any structure, 
and we will try and store it in that index. But as I say, if you're going to be doing search across it, some of those fields will need to be common in some way for it to make sense for you to put that together. But it does mean that you can evolve your data over time, which is something that very much happens in businesses as they build out applications, as they understand their needs, they start to add different fields to the data that they're starting to store. And over time, that data may become more useful for the business going forward. So I said there's no set schema, uh, but we do have a concept called mapping. And mapping is about determining and guiding Elasticsearch in how it actually stores the data into its various index data structures, which is how we're going to provide the search capability that you want. So to kind of explain that a little bit more, um, if your JSON document comes in and it has something that looks like a text field on there, um, the good chance is that's going to be text data that you want to be able to just search across. But before Elasticsearch determines that, it might do a little bit of parsing and go, well, does this thing actually conform to a known date time string? If it does, then if it looks like a date, we'll treat it as a date. And this happens the first time a field is seen, new field is seen for any document. Elasticsearch will infer by default um, a sort of an implicit mapping for that field unless you've given it any other information. So other types of mappings that you'll see is if it sees something that looks like a number, then it will choose one of the number field types to use for that. Um, and this is where you have to get a little careful. Though This sort of implied mapping is fine but it, it will make the best judgment based on the first bit of data it sees. So we'll see that a little bit in the demo when I talk about how I've chosen the mappings for that demo scenario. But other things that you'll have in there is obviously text. This is going to be a key part of your search capability. And, and one of the reasons a lot of people will go to Elasticsearch is for some form of full text search capability in their, in their environment. Search is an interesting thing across text because we actually index that data in two ways by default. We store it into what's called a text field. Uh, which is what provides the full text search capability. So this is where the data is actually analyzed and, and tokenized so that the individual terms can be sort of read from that um, and then used to store in the inverted index that's used for that very quick lookup between terms and the documents that contain them. So this process uh, does a number of things as part of that sort of analysis and tokenization. Um, things like punctuation are lost or removed from there. Stop words by default will be removed, so and, the, it, those sign of words are not going to be really useful in any kind of search, so they're stripped from the documents by default, and typically all of those tokens will be lower cased as well, that means, you know, the search, full text search is generally sort of case insensitive by default. This is all configurable, you can configure which filters run for which fields and how you want to analyze the data as it comes through, um, but the default system is, is the one that I've just described. The other way that text data is stored by default is into what's called a keyword field type as well. And this is where the data is designed for kind of exact match scenarios. Um, and so this is the best guess that Elasticsearch can make if you've not pr provided any guidance. It will give you kind of both those options. But each of those indexing structures has some overhead. And it's typically unlikely that you're going to need both for, both, uh, for all field types. So this is where explicit mapping comes in. And you can start to say for your uh, index configuration that you want a particular mapping for particular fields and say, actually, this thing that looks like a string is actually a version number or it's an IP address. Um, these types of additional mappings give us additional capabilities in, within Elasticsearch because as soon as we know a field type is of one of these special types, we can treat it in such a way that, for example, with versions, we can sort them for you in semver order rather than just alphabetical order, which may not always give you the res results that you're expecting. Similarly, we support things like geodata, so you can provide lat long data and things like that, and then you can perform geo-based searches over the data, providing a central point and a radius that you want to search for documents within, or you can set a geo boundary around the area that you want to search for and find records that fall into that zone. So there's lots and lots of field types, and, and this is really about understanding your data. Most people, if they're kind of proto some, prototyping something new, they'll start with the inferred mappings and just take what Elasticsearch does out of the box. And as they start to understand their data, both what's coming in and how people are going to be searching across it, what the use cases are for that data, you might start to adjust your mappings over time. Now, you can't necessarily change your mapping in an existing index. You have to do something called re-indexing. You create a new index structure with a new mapping that defines exactly how you want this data to be indexed and then just re-index the data through to it. But this is how typically people will evolve data in their businesses. Now, all of Elasticsearch is accessible through its HTTP interface, um, and a lot of people will work with it that way. But as I showed earlier, we have Kibana, which is a UI system that basically provides a UI layer and gives you access to do a lot of this capability directly in a UI. 
But we'll be thinking about the interface a bit more in a moment because we're talking about clients at the end of this session. Just to give you a few numbers, um, there's now over 400 API endpoints in Elasticsearch. Pretty much any of the things that you can do with Elasticsearch can be done through HTTP, and, and we expose APIs for doing it. So even things like the ML capabilities for defining the jobs that can run, uh, for starting and stopping those ML jobs, uh, all of that can be done through the API configuration of the cluster, um, pretty much anything. Which means there's a lot of data structures and there's a lot of types that are involved in that. So we have over 50 distinct querying types, um, over 70 different types of aggregations. So how do you want to group data and, and analyze information in, in aggregate form? And, and those different field types that I talked about for defining fields explicitly that map to your data types that you're sending in. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of parts to this API. And keep that in mind when I come to talking about the .NET client in a moment. So I work on the language clients team. Um, there's about eight or nine of us, and we maintain the language clients. Um, these are the, the, the main ones. There are other sort of subsets of these, but these are the main ones, and all of the sort of core languages are covered there. And each client is designed to be idiomatic to the language. So Java and .NET, they're the most strongly typed clients. Uh, we provide classes that represent requests and responses so that you can work with your data in a, in a pattern that you're used to in other .NET applications, for example. But for the other languages, you know, those are designed more in mind with whichever uh, sort of patterns are used and design patterns are needed for those languages. Um, and so you, you should find them sort of pretty compatible if you're working with any of those languages to things you've seen elsewhere in them. So in terms of existing clients, um, the existing .NET client today uh, is built of kind of two uh, NuGet packages. Uh, and this is in the 7x range, so 7.17 is kind of the, the latest um, minor version of that. Um, and this is the client that's out there today and is publicly available. Uh, you use it against the 17, uh, uh, 7.17 server or 7x server, but you can also use it against 8.0, and that's quite important at the moment because we haven't GA'd an 8.0 client just yet. Um, but we do have now in 8.0 a kind of compatibility header that you can send across that tells it what type of um, version of response you want. So now the 7.17 client can be used against an 8.0 server as long as you enable that header so that, it, that the server knows to send you data in a particular format. And this client is built with two parts. The Elasticsearch.net library is our low-level client. And for probably 99% of people, you shouldn't be using this. You don't need to be using this directly. Um, it is a very low-level sort of abstraction over the top of essentially the transport functionality of talking to Elasticsearch and um, basic mappings between you know, an endpoint name and a URL, really. And what this is, is it's our kind of dependency-free layer that's fairly unopinionated about sort of working as a client, and it really is focused on handling the transport functionality. So when you configure your client, you can give it URLs for all of the nodes that are available in your system, and it can keep track of those. It will round robin request to those, and it will also identify if a node becomes unresponsive, it will stop trying to send it requests for a period of time. That kind of transport layer functionality uh, is in, sort of encapsulated in there. And it does have a basic form of request and response, but if you're going to be using it, you need to par pass it the actual JSON structures to send to the server and that you're going to get back. So that's usually in either in byte or string form. So that's why it's not really most useful for most people. It's more of a building block library um, and potentially a scenario if you're in extremely high performance scenarios and you want a bit more control over uh, allocations around JSON to, to type mappings, uh, you might start using it for that. But generally, what you want to be using is Nest. Uh, Nest is the high-level client. And this is where the strongly typed uh, nature of the client starts to come in. So we have mappings um, and, and types that represent all of the requests and responses for all of the endpoints, plus all of the subtypes of those that they then expose as well. And as I talked about, that's over 400 endpoints, so that's already sort of 800 types just for requests and responses. Before you start getting into all those nuanced data structures, all of the different representations of an aggregation of the different fields that can be configured and things like that. We also expose a query DSL representation. So Elasticsearch has a querying uh, domain-specific language that you use, and we've modeled that as closely as we can to sort of how you would like to work with this DSL through .NET. Um, it's not necessarily perfect, but we provide two patterns for, for all of the types in .NET uh, for the high-level clients. So we have the object initializer pattern, which is really, you know, create a new search request and set properties and then pass it to the client. 
And that might work quite nicely in some scenarios, but as things get more complex and you build up these kind of deeper and deeper queries, all of this nested new object creation gets a little bit painful. And so in that scenario, we also provide what we call the fluent syntax, which gives you kind of this chainability of method calls that you can make to configure those components. And, and we'll see what that looks like when I get to the code in a moment. But these are the two projects today. They're you know, extremely highly used. Um, as I say, Nest is the one that you want to be picking up if you're kind of getting into this stuff brand new. So there are some problems with the existing client uh, that we've kind of identified that we, we're starting to try and work on solutions for. The first thing is it's handwritten. Um, nearly all of it's handwritten. And what I mean by this is we have some basic code generation for the low-level client that we'll be able to say, given the specification that exists in Elasticsearch, the repo, we can kind of create the endpoint to URL mappings and the basic query string structures that a request and response to that endpoint might take. But all we can do after that is basically stub out the rest request and response types as partial classes. And then the maintainers, myself, uh, come in and we fill in the blanks and put in all of the properties that are available on those request response and have to model everything. And in the early days of Elasticsearch, when there were tens or hundreds of endpoints, this wasn't too much of a problem. But obviously, that's a lot of maintenance work as you start getting towards 400 endpoints that can all be evolving in each uh, minor release of Elasticsearch. And so that does mean that at times the API uh, that's available in .NET isn't always 100% consistent with the API of Elasticsearch. So we might not have properties exposed on those requests and responses that you can set and send in the data uh, over the wire. This is obviously a problem. If you can find one, raise an issue, and we'll get that in as soon as we can. But it's a manual piece of work, and there is obviously gaps in terms of understanding what's exactly been done by the, the server team to make sure it's in all of the clients. The other thing about this existing client is we have an internalized version of something called UTF-8 JSON, which we use for serialization. And UTF-8 JSON is a kind of open source, high level, uh, high performance, I should say, serializer that's generally about trying to be quite low allocation and quite efficient. But it's quite an old open source project that's kind of gone out of maintenance. So our copy actually lives inside our own code base. We actually internalized that code, uh, mainly because we needed some customizations to, the, to it that were very sort of Elasticsearch type specific because we have a lot of polymorphic types in, in the uh, requests and responses, particularly around aggregations and searching, that are really hard to map. And you generally need some quite low level ability to write JSON code to be able to model those um, and serialize to and from them. So that's the reason we've got it kind of internalized. And we've patched bits of it over time as we found bugs with it. Um, it generally performs pretty well. And it's probably better than some, using something like Newtonsoft JSON in terms of allocations and memory footprint. Um, but it, it has some issues, it's not perfect, and we've definitely found areas where it over allocates and it doesn't necessarily return memory as quickly as it should do. Um, there's a lot of maintenance in that code if we're going to carry it forward. Um, and there's 10 years nearly of historical de decisions that have gone into this library. It came out very early when Elasticsearch was first available, and it's evolved um, over time as Elasticsearch has grown. And so it means that early decisions that were made around the structure of how some of this works were designed at the kind of tens or hundreds of APIs that we need to model uh, kind of era. And now we're at this point where we have hundreds um, of complex types that we have to deal with. And also, .NET's evolved as a language. The sort of patterns and the language features and capabilities have changed in 10 years. We've gone through the, the .NET core era as well. Um, and so it would be nice if we could start to take a little bit more advantage of that as where we can. So these are some of the problems that when I joined about a year and a half ago, I kind of identified as things that maybe I'd like to look at. And, and the team had already got some of these in mind as well as, as things that are problematic. And so I can introduce what we're working on at the moment in terms of the ATO client, which is the new, the new Elasticsearch uh, .NET package. So there's a few core things. Uh, it's a new name. It doesn't, we don't call it Nest anymore partly because I couldn't really work out if Nest meant anything to anyone that was outside of using it today. It's not something you would first think to search for if you're a brand new user to Elasticsearch uh, and you go, OK, well, I'm doing .NET, I'm doing Elasticsearch, I need the client. You're probably not going to think to search the word Nest. Um, but that's not the main reason we've made this change. I also wanted to give it a new package and assembly name because of some of the stuff that we're doing. That means it is going to be a, a fairly big break. Um, historically, I've experienced the breaking nature of Elasticsearch between major versions and, and gone through some of the pain that you have to do to upgrade between those. And it, it is a bit of a, a trade-off between, well, how do we evolve something while not breaking while making things better? 
Um, but in this case, we've made some decisions that really have kind of forced our hand, and I'll talk a bit more about those uh, now. So the, the first important thing is we know that it's not sustainable to keep manually creating the types for uh, the, the client ourselves. Um, it, you know, it leads to those gaps, it leads to errors, and it's time consuming. It means that my time on the client is not spent making it more uh, performant or adding sort of value add higher level features that make it easier to do particular things within Elasticsearch. It's mostly spent maintaining that API surface and just keeping uh, those roughly consistent. And so we're moving to a code generation approach for our new version of clients. And as a client's team, what we've done is built out a TypeScript representation of the, the types of the, that can represent those API endpoints and the requests and responses and all the, the subtypes of those and model them in such a way that we can also add our own various attributes to those that we know are kind of elastic searchisms that we need to deal with, like these kind of polymorphic types where we have various different forms of polymorphism and how that's modeled in the data structures that come back. And so we need to flag those so that individual clients can do the best thing when they're co-generating to produce the, the, kind of the most useful code for that language. And so we start with the TypeScript. We then use a com compilation process that eventually will, after checking a bunch of things, spit out a JSON schema. It's a custom schema. And some of you may be thinking, well, wh why not use something like OpenAPI? We are looking at what we can do to actually generate an OpenAPI spec. But um, OpenAPI doesn't expose quite enough of the kind of uh, distinct uh, possibilities around that polymorphism that I talked about, around these different response types. Um, so it makes it very hard to model it fully. Um, and so that's not sufficient for, for actually co-generating a full client at this point in time. And so what we've done is we've created this sort of custom schema that gives us the capability to add all of those additional flags and that additional sort of meta information into the spec that we can then, as, as client team, consume. So now I'm doing that code generation. What we do is we take the JSON schema. I read that in. I do a bunch of sort of upfront work, working out what types that needs, how those things interrelate. Um, you know, essentially create sort of a meta structure that represents what the client should look like. And then I'm using the Roslyn APIs of .NET to actually produce uh, the new client code. Um, that's a talk in itself, and probably you know maybe next year I can come back and talk about a bit more how that actually works. But fundamentally, we build up, you know, using the Roslyn APIs, you can build up a syntax tree that's essentially what the compiler sees when it looks at your code in, in its written form. But we can build that syntax tree up by hand in code uh, from the spec, and then I can use it to spit out C sharp files uh, at the end of it that represent those types. So all of the requests and responses, um, all of the sort of related types that those then depend on, are now code generated off of this spec. Um, and I think at the moment when I run the code generator, it's at least two and a half thousand types are being created now automatically off of this spec. That's obviously a lot of work to get a code generator of that scale working accurately, and I'm still working through some of the final issues, uh, which is why we don't have a GA client just yet. But I think we can see the benefits. That means you get much greater consistency. We'll be able to run this process you know, every day if we want to in our, in our build systems uh, against the spec. And if things have changed, the client will be updated to reflect them. And you'll essentially get day one sort of parity between client and server, which will be really nice. And it also, as I say, frees my time up to do that value add work and, and deal with those sort of higher level challenges that people face when building applications against Elasticsearch. Um, one of the other key changes is we moved to system text JSON for the serialization. So if you haven't heard of it, this is Microsoft's uh, new in-the-box JSON serializer. Um, it's been in the box with .NET for a few releases now, but it first came out, it was a little bit kind of feature incomplete in terms of what we needed. But we're now at the point where it does enough. It doesn't do everything I'd like, but it does enough that I can kind of work around those gaps that we can actually use it internally as a serializer. And what that means is we no longer have to maintain all of this serialization code ourselves. We can rely on Microsoft. We've done a really good job of creating a library, profiling it, and, and have got the engineering power behind that to actually make sure that we have a really good high level, uh, high um, efficiency serializer within .NET um, that ships in the box. So it's not a dependency you necessarily need to take because newer .NET versions just have it available to them as well. Um, but it is net standard compatible. So if you're still using the libraries on sort of .NET uh, framework, you can still use that serializer on our, our newer packages. But this gives us um, is a lot of work to do this. As it turns out, there's a lot of custom conversion that needs to happen, as I say, for that, that polymorphic nature of some of our types and our more complex JSON structures. Um, but we're at a point now where that's pretty much working for all of the key parts of the, uh, the client 
The other thing we did was we removed what is essentially the low level client and made it its own package called elastic.transport. Um, this would be the thing that you, you know, if you're in a really high performance scenario and you're building more of a, uh, a library on top, you might be looking at. And this is really a, just about that transport layer nature, but we've tried to make it a little bit more sort of product agnostic. So it's a gen generic transport that works for our distributed setup that we could apply to other of our products. And hint, hint, we might be able to do the clients that are built on this for some of our other services so that you can manage those. Um, for example, Enterprise Search has an API. It would be nice to have a .NET client for that. And ultimately, this gives us, with all of this meaningless breaking changes as a nature of the fact that we've gone from something that was handcrafted with care and we ensured every type name was unique and didn't conflict with other types within the, in the namespace, we're now in a situation where we, we're generating more generally off of the spec. So it, we have to have some more namespaces in there. Type names may change because we're going off the spec. We don't want to make this sort of go back to the point where we've gone off a spec and then we handcraft everything by using configuration. And so we've accepted that there will be some breaks, but most of the stuff is reasonably consistent. Um, and I'm trying to close those gaps as best I can. But also this means we have the opportunity to try and remove some legacy and, and make the client better, take some feedback that people have given us over the sort of past few years about what they do, do and don't like about how it's kind of structured uh, and try and take that on board as well. So with that, I can get to a, a little bit of a demo. Um, I'm going to be reliant on the Wi-Fi, so hopefully Elastic Cloud's up and running, uh, just in case it's not. Let's start a Docker container behind the scenes. So what I'm going to do for this demo is it is, you know, again, it's going to be a, a getting started demo. I'm going to use the new ATO client. Um, I'm using a, a CI build of the new client because I added some stuff last week I wanted to, to include in here. So um, it's been a good experience for me to kind of dog food my own client and find a few of the gaps. But it's pretty much um, got everything that I wanted. So in terms of the data we're dealing with, hopefully this is big enough at the back. Um, this is just the CSV file that we're going to be working with, which is some 600,000 rows of stock data from 2013 to 2018, I think. Um, and you can see, you know, we have for each day, there's uh, for each stock symbol that was on the market, there's the, the high, low, close uh, values for those. Um, so that's what we're working with. In terms of the .NET modeling of that, then I have essentially a, a POCO DTO that just models the, the fields that are available there. The only additional stuff in this file is a little bit of a factory method just to parse it out of the file and create the type. Um, and I've got a very basic dictionary for just some of the, the stock symbol names to look them up against their full name that will be useful for, for searching in a moment. So the first thing I'm going to need to do is hopefully I'm still on Elastic Cloud. I am. So this is my Elastic Cloud deployment that I've spun up. Um, these credentials will be gone by the end of the talk, so hopefully no one will hack them in the meantime. Um, but what I've grabbed from the cloud is the cloud ID. And this is just a really long... Uh, sort of string, it's base encoded data that we need to connect. And this is the easiest way to get started with the client. Um, you don't need to kind of get all of the URLs and things, just chuck in the cloud ID and we'll parse that data from this string. The only other thing I need uh, is going to be the username and password. And Elastic Cloud gives us a username and password by default when it's started. And I'm just going to grab that password for the Elastic user. This commented code here is about setting up a local uh, version of the client that talks to my local Docker instance. We don't need it if the cloud um, is reachable from here. Um, but you can see the setup is very similar, just with uh, some additional information. But for the cloud, all I need to do is call new Elasticsearch client, pass in that cloud ID, and basic, a basic auth uh, object here. You can also use API key authentication if you need to. So that's all we need to do to create an instance of the client. Um, and the first thing I'm going to do in this code here is uh, call into the client, and I'm going to call into the indices area of the client that relates to APIs under the kind of indexing namespace uh, or sort of the sub area of the API, I should say. So indices exists async just calls into a method that's going to map to the exists endpoint for that index area. Um, and it just takes, in this scenario, the, the, the minimum I need is this index name, which is just a, a string that represents the name of the index that I'm going to check for. So this will check if the index exists. Um, what this code will then do is say, well, if it doesn't exist, I'm going to create it. And so in here, again, we're in that sort of indices area, but now we're calling create async. We're passing the index name. And then this is nearly completely fluent. There's a little bit that isn't fluent here. Um, and I'll show you the, uh, the 7x version in a minute. But 
this is sort of this syntax down here is kind of what I mean by fluent. So we call into dot settings, and within settings we can set number of shards one, number of replicas zero, um, and and basically configure it. This isn't a production ready uh, demo, so don't follow these settings for your own production systems. The other thing we can provide is these mappings. So this is how we define that explicit mapping between fields that we're going to be sending Elasticsearch and how they should be stored. Now, this is where I'm not influencing text because at the moment my code generator doesn't know how to generate the fluent descriptor for this, um, but sometime next week it should. Um, but for now, what I'm doing is just newing up the, the mappings just to show you what this looks like in 7x. Um, it's not all that dissimilar, but with the fluent syntax, you call into dot keyword and then you can access the name that you want to set as a keyword field in here. And what this does is take the, the name, but rather than you hard coding magic strings everywhere that represent the, the name you want to uh, mark as a keyword field, we can do what we call type inference. And here you just provide an expression that says, okay, well, I want the, the symbol property on the stock data to be used as the field name. And what we do behind the scenes, by default, that's essentially just gonna camel case the property name um, because that's the default expectation for the JSON structures you'd like to send in. Uh, but you can configure that and, and change how that inference works if you need to. Um, the other thing we're doing then is setting up these number properties. And again, it's this fluent syntax dot number. Once you're into there, you can configure its name and the specific number type that you want. So back to version eight, uh, the difference here is that, as I say, I'm just creating this kind of dictionary myself with the field name without inference here and the, the, the type of property I want that field to be. So the reason I'm doing this explicit mapping is for the symbols, for example, the MSFT or something that would represent Microsoft stock, we're not going to need to full text search that field because generally we're just going to say, well, find me all of the MSFT stock. Um, it's not going to be a, a full text type of search. And so rather than have Elasticsearch index that into an inverted index that supports the capability of full text search, which requires memory and data structures, we're just going to say, actually, no, we know how this type of data is only ever going to be queried in a full text form sorry, an exact match form. Uh, so we will define it purely as a keyword rather than as a, a text property. These other ones are a little bit more interesting. So these are the numeric data that represents the stock values. I've explicitly marked these as floats because although Elasticsearch will generally infer that quite happily, um, if there's kind of decimal places in the data, I do know that my data file, if the numbers aren't uh, rounded to 0, 0.0, it just gives an exact integer looking value. So if the first document that goes in actually has that sort of integer representation of the numbers, Elasticsearch will see that and go, well, this looks like an integer. I will treat this field as an inter integer field. Um, when actually the, the vast majority of these documents are going to need to have the decimal places. So this is where you get into ex explicit mapping. You understand your data so that you can give Elasticsearch some proper guidance about how it should treat it. So in this case, I'm just saying they're all floats. After this runs, I'm going to check that my response was valid and whether it was acknowledged by the server. And if it wasn't, I'll throw an exception. And then I need to get some data into Elasticsearch. So we can index data document by document, just doing a, an index document um, command. Um, and that's fine for sort of ad hoc small amounts of data as they're coming in. Um, but it's not super efficient if we're doing this kind of scenario where we want to ingest a large volume of data rapidly because each of those index document requests is going to be a, an individual HTTP request. So there's overhead and um, sort of uh, back and forth with the server for that to happen. So Elasticsearch supports a bulk API endpoint that takes a new line delimited JSON format that represents various operations you want to perform. And we provide what we call a helper that kind of wraps that API for doing bulk ingestion. So in this case, we, we call that bulk all. And what this takes is uh, an enumerable of data. So if I jump down here, this is just an enumerable uh, on my type down here. That's essentially reading line by line from the file and yielding those lines as it gets them. Um, so just a sort of poor man's uh, enumerable there. But any enumerable source can be passed in here. And then the other configuration, which again is in this fluent syntax, defines how do we want that data treated. So I'm going to send it to the index with this index name. I want to deal with back off scenarios. So if the server says, whoa, I'm overloaded, it will give us a 429 or something back to say, can you back off for a bit? I haven't got the capacity to take any more data right now. Um, we tell the client, well, OK, in this case, we'll retry up to 20 times in that scenario. And each time we'll wait 10 seconds and give the server that, that time uh, to back off. The other scenario we're dealing with here is what do we do if documents are dropped? So, Although the request may succeed and Elasticsearch receives our 1,000 documents or whatever we're sending it, um, if some of those have data that doesn't, can't be applied to the mappings that exist for those types, 
then Elasticsearch is going to throw up its hands and say, this isn't valid. I can't, I can't store this. Um, and so those will be dropped. Um, and by default, we want to deal with those, but we want to deal with them separately. So we're going to say, continue after any drop documents. Ignore the fact that you know, maybe one out of the set that we sent couldn't be indexed. But we will, this callback will be called for us so that we can provide some handling for that. So we might, here I'm logging to a console, but you could also put these into a dead letter queue or some other structure and deal with them as you need to. The final things I'm setting are uh, parallelism. You don't have to define this manually. I have here just to, ex to show that it, it exists. We'll infer a CPU count by default. Um, but this is how many concurrent HTTP requests are we going to be sending as part of this batch work that we're doing. And then the size is how many documents do we put into each uh, individual request, essentially. So here we're saying a batch size of 1,000. So we put 1,000 documents into that uh, request body and ship it up to the server. Finding the exact balance that's the most efficient is, again, a bit of trial and error. It depends on your data structures and how large things are. You know, you could assume, oh, I'm going to make this 10,000 and everything will be quicker. But obviously, you're then getting to larger and larger request sizes that have to be shipped over the network. And it might actually be less efficient to put that a large volume of data per request. So finding the right trade-off for your network environment and for the data you're sending is, is important. But somewhere in a thousand is a good starting point, And then you can kind of play around with the figures. Now, this bulk haul is an eye observable. And it actually kicks off the operation in the background on a background thread. Um, and then that's actually started immediately. But uh, in this case, what we want to do is actually block this application proceeding until we know that that's all finished. So I'm going to use this observer here that's a helper, again, on top of that observable. And this observer just says, well, actually, I want to wait on this thing completing. Um, in this case, I'm going to wait for up to 10 minutes for this complete operation to run. And every time uh, we get a, this is the on next delegate. So every time a response comes back uh, to this, this bulk operation that's happening behind the scenes, we want to run this delegate. And in this case, we'll just log to the console. So before I get onto the rest of this code, let's kick this off and pray that the network's good. And we should start to see some data uh, being indexed there, hopefully. Yes, good. Um, it's a bit small, but all it's saying is data indexed. Um, and that's just each of those bulk operations um, happening and going over the wire to the server. So the 600,000 records, it's going to take it you know, a few seconds to complete. But with this bulk operation, this bulk all helper, I should say, um, you can see we've just indexed nearly half a million, well, over half a million documents uh, while we've been stood here uh, listening to me chat on. Um, and so that's actually now in a position where we've got our data in. And uh, the next thing we might want to do once we've got data in, into our index is actually start searching on it. So let's start with a really simple search. Uh, let's say we just want to get back all of the documents for the Microsoft stock. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to create a, a query um, as part of our search here. And the, the simplest query for this scenario, where we just want to say, does it match this, uh, uh, does this match uh, on this term or not, and just filter the documents down, is to use a filter query in here, um, which is term-based. So the field, again, using inference, would be whatever is the symbol property on our, our stock object uh, or stock data type uh, will be used as a field name. And then the value we want to match is MSFT. So this is keyword match, remember. So it's case sensitive and it's an exact match, because that's how we map the data. And then we're going to limit the response size here. So we only just want the first 20 for now. And we can do a sort um, in, on the server to get them descending by date. Once we um, get back a response, uh, we can access the documents on that response. And because this search async here is strongly typed using this generic to our data type, um, these documents will be deserialized off the response into our stock data type for us. So once we're here, data is a stock data object instance. And so that means we can just access its properties and, and write some stuff out to the console. So not too exciting, but um, we can just run that. And again, we've hit the breakpoint. So we've got our first 20 rows there uh, with the values for each of those dates. So uh, that's a very simple kind of filter-based query um, that we can do. If we want to do something that is a bit more realistic with some full text search, uh, let's run this search here. Um, the index again is the same index. The query now is going to be a match. So this is where we start to get into full text searching. And what we're saying is we want to match this term ink within the name of the stock data. So for the name of the company. Um, again, we're just going to get the first 20 in descending. And again, we can access the documents. So the difference here is that we're now starting to go into that full text index and say, find any of the documents that have the term ink in there somewhere as a distinct token word. We run the search. And as we'd expect, uh, we get the data. The interesting thing to point out, although this is a bit small, let's just make this a bit bigger. 
Um, the, uh, the name here, so this one is obviously uppercase I and then NC. This one has a period after it. So because of the, the tokenization and then the analysis of that, that string field as it went into the index, um, it means we've mapped all of these documents, uh, which is typically the behavior you're going to want for this kind of stuff. But again, you can configure these options for your needs. Um, as I'm getting towards the end of time, I'll quickly show the aggregation example, and uh, then we are good for any questions that we may have. Um, so in this case, again, the search is what we started with the first time. So we're going to just do a simple filter for all of the Microsoft uh, stock data. But now we're getting into a scenario where we actually want to do some sort of aggregation of that data and understand it in a different form. And so in this case, what we're going to do is say, well, let's try and get all of the Microsoft data and, and for each month work out the total volume of trades that happened. So in this scenario, what we can do is we can use a date histogram aggregation, which is essentially bucket the data by some calendar interval. Uh, in this case, the calendar interval is monthly. When we create the aggregation that we want, we provide a name. This allows us to grab it back off the response later on. Um, in terms of the field we're using, again, we're using the kind of inferred field name for the date property on our data type, because that's obviously the only date we have to actually uh, bucket this on. Uh, we can order it by key descending, which essentially is date descending. And then we can actually perform a sub-aggregation. So we said we wanted everything by month, which we've achieved by doing a date histogram aggregation. Now we're in the situation where we want to total up uh, or sum the volume of trades that occurred. So in this case, we do another aggregation under each sort of date bucket. And this is a sum aggregation called trade volumes that, again, just needs to know uh, the field that we want to sum up, in this case, the volume field. And so when this comes back, we get this um, aggregations on the response here. And what we can do is call into the, these methods to start accessing aggregations from there. So uh, we could call get date histogram. We would want the date histogram aggregation named by month. And then we want to access each individual bucket that's on there, which is just a collection of those buckets by month. And then we can just for each over these in a standard for each loop here. And for each monthly bucket, we'll call uh, get sum, which allows us to then go into its sub aggregations and ask for the sum aggregation called trade volumes. And this is just a basic metric aggregation. So in this case, we don't have buckets, we just have the value, which is the result of the sum operation. And so now we have the volume for the number of trades that occurred. And um, in this case, what we're doing then is writing these out to the console uh, and we can access the key to get essentially the date of the bucket so that we can put the date in and uh, it scrolls off here. And then we're just writing out that volume. So if I now run this example, uh, you can see we get all of the dates uh, bucketed, so 2018 backwards for the, the age of this data. And this is the, the number of trades that occurred for Microsoft stock in, in that given month. So there's you know, a few scenarios there, basic sort of uh, exact matching of data, the more common full text searching that you might do against you know, larger volumes of text data, and then this capability to do sort of metrics and data analysis with aggregations and things like that. So we're pretty much at the end of time. Let's just run this final couple of slides. Um, so in terms of resources for what I've shown you, again, the most important link is this bit.ly link. So if you grab a photo of this slide and grab that link, this will take you to the slide deck, and then you've got all the other links I'm about to show you. Um, obviously, the first thing is our, our GitHub repo for the .NET client. So if you're working with the .NET client and you have issues or ideas or whatever, uh, you, can, you can write those and, and report them to us in, in this repo. Uh, we have our documentation um, on Elastic.co. So we have obviously guides for Elasticsearch itself, and then we have the client-specific guides that you may need to find. Uh, the existing 7x client Nest is on NuGet under the name Nest, which is easily searchable. And if you want to start playing with a new client, it's in alpha 10 at the moment. Uh, Elastic.clients.elasticsearch is, is now how we're referring to that package name. Um, and that's going to be the, the new client going forward. So if you're really interested in seeing how that works in your scenarios um, with the early alphas, just don't put it in production yet, because we will have some more changes. Um, then you can go and find it there. Uh, the example I've just shown you is in my repo. So Elasticsearch does examples, and you'll find what I've just shown you on screen. If you want to look at those queries again, I'll just dig into the code a little bit more. Um, and we have an online forum, discuss.elastic.co. Uh, if you have general questions, you know, uh, and that could be not just client related, but search related as well. How do I do X? What's the best way to get started with you know, why and why I'm running into these things? So that's about questions. The repo is more about issues and, and direct features that you need. Um, otherwise, um, Thank you very much for coming. I'm glad to see some people here.
if you don't get to talk to me after the session, and I do ask that you come up to find me during the next few days if you have questions or feedback on Elasticsearch and .NET. Um, but if not, you can find me online at Steve J. Gordon. And I've been asked to remind you to, to leave your review as you leave um, on the way out. So thank you very much. Appreciate your time. And I'll see you hopefully next year. <laughs>